honorable ministers, excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> My name is Abebe Haile Gabriel, FAO Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Africa based in Accra, Ghana, moderator of this session. I wish to welcome you all to this important session and sincerely thank you, uh, particularly the distinguished panelists for joining us. It's an honor and privilege for FAO to co-host this important session. For obvious reasons, the topic that we will be discussed will be discussing the, uh, during this particular session is very strategic and very significant. It's, it's about the nexus between food security, nutrition, agriculture, and economic, economic transformation, but also uh, LDCs and, and Africa. In a way, uh, this topic is even consequential for uh, the proposed actions discussed in the rest of the other sections. Uh, it has meanings for peaceful, just, and inclusive societies, for science, technology, and innovation, for trade and regional integration, for human development, for resilience, and so on. And as we all know, most of the LDCs are actually in Africa. Uh, so essentially, the agenda on LDCs is an African agenda. The majority, majority of Africans uh, in these countries live in rural areas, uh, aching their living from uh, agriculture and other rural economic activities. However, the performance of uh, the agriculture and the rural sector has been less than satisfactory. Uh, we know that uh, we are lagging behind in terms of progress towards achieving SDGs, uh, notably uh, SDGs on ending poverty and ending hunger, as well as reducing inequality. Uh, Africa is also uh, known for its high vulnerability to different kinds of shocks, be it climate, transboundary diseases and pests, conflicts, economic downturns, and so on, uh, which limited, with, with limited capacity to absorb those shocks. So the key to achieving all this is to transform the agriculture and food systems in an inclusive, sustainable, and resilient manner. Success in Africa will have far-reaching positive impacts for the entire world, not just for the Africa region. The session uh, will start with a keynote address, which will set the scene for subsequent interactive discussion and my colleague, Dr. Maximo Torero Kulen, who is the chief economist of FAO, uh, will give us a keynote address. But uh, we are also joined by high level panelists representing a cross section of stakeholders, uh, honorable ministers uh, of member states. Uh, I have already talked to Dr. Kalibata, uh, uh, the farmers organization from partners organization, including PAFO and AGRA. Uh, I will introduce the uh, panelists later on, but uh, without further ado, let me invite uh, Maximo to give us his presentation. Maximo, over to you. Dear colleagues, excellencies, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today to talk about building sustainable, inclusive and resilient food systems in African LDCs. Let me start by sharing my presentation uh, so that we can go through it. I am going to focus today in four core elements. What is the context before and after COVID-19, relevant analytical frameworks, actions and recommendations, and concluding remarks. Let me first start by saying that it's essential that we took a system approach. And please, it's important to understand that these agri-food systems in plural, because every country, every region has its own systems that we need to take into account. But the important thing is that when we look at agriculture, we cannot look at it as a silo. We have to look at it in a comprehensive way, because agriculture affects our natural resources, agriculture affects our environment, and agriculture, of course, brings the benefits and the food security for our human beings and reduces poverty. If we don't look at it as a system approach, we won't be able to measure the trade-offs. 
every action we do in agriculture, in any sector, will have trade-offs, will have consequence on other sectors. Like, for example, if we intensify production, we could affect our natural resources. If we produce more cattle, we will affect emissions. So we need to find and understand the magnitude of those trade-offs and also of synergies, the positive effects. By understanding those trade-offs, we can assess carefully which are the best policies that will allow us to achieve our goal, which is SDE2, but also at the same time will allow us to achieve it, minimizing those trade-offs. That's why looking at the agri-food system is so important. Now, what is happening with our system? The agri-food system has not been delivered. Even before COVID-19, hungry and undernourished people were 690 million in 2019. Stunting among children was an acceptable high. Micronutrient deficiencies uh, harm over 2 billion people. Healthy diets were not affordable for 3 billion people. Obesity was more than 800 million people. And safe food affects 1 in 10 people. High food loss and waste, we measure 14% only in losses. Environmental destructions, most of our environmental land, water and sea and atmosphere are pushed to its limits. And 80% of the rural poverty, of the extreme poverty, are in rural areas, which is where agriculture is the, mainly, the main economic activity. And finally, inequalities has been increasing in more than half of the countries in the world, especially LDCs. What this means, that if we don't reduce inequalities, we won't be able to achieve and move out of poverty in a sustainable way. But COVID-19 came and created even a worse situation. The pandemic only in hunger, our estimates show that it will increase between 83 to 132 million people globally in 2020 due to COVID-19. This will affect, of course, LDC countries, which will pay the largest toll, and it's because lack of access to agricultural inputs, it will affect our labor supply. We know that 1.2 billion people work directly in agriculture, which means 4, 4 billion people working in agriculture at the end of the line. And 30% of those has been affected because of COVID-19. And the commodity market has been impacted. Not only directly, we have seen volatility in food prices of staples, but also indirectly because of the economic recession that will reduce the demand of our high value commodities coming from the LDC region. Not only that, if we focus on nutritional outcomes, in addition to other issues like education, for example, but just focusing on nutrition, which is at the core of our mandate, childhood stunting will increase in 2.6 million chronically malnourished children by 2022. It's the first time that we change the train again back. We reverse the decreasing curve for the first time in three decades. Childhood wasting, 6.7 million additional children under five could suffer from wasting. 10,000 additional child deaths per month. And childhood obesity means that childhood will worsen. Obesity will worsen due to negative impact on diet and physical activity. So obesity, of course, is associated with higher level. Now, why is this so important when we talk about the value chain development? Because if we have, in the case of, of the least developed countries, we have 22% prevalence of undernourishment in Sub-Saharan Africa, 235 million people undernourished in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2019, 430 million region, the only region in the world where the number of extreme poor has increased. And we have lost because of COVID-19 more than a decade. And 70 to 80% depend on agriculture and renewable natural resources for the livelihoods. So agriculture and rural areas and the rural transformation is central to be able to achieve what we are trying to achieve to be able to transform our agri-food system. Now FAO, because of COVID-19, created a recovery response plan. This recovery comprehensive plan is designed to proactively and sustainably address socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic in line with the UN approach to build back better. And in pursuit of a sustainable development goals, it aims to mitigate the immediate impacts of the pandemic while strengthening the long-term resilience of food systems and livelihoods. Our plan, which tries to take the opportunity of the COVID-19, has seven priority areas. Global humanitarian response plan, Data for decision making is crucial to have a state of the art data, real time data to know where to target and where to do interventions. Economic inclusion and social protection to reduce poverty. We have to scale up our social protection program to help the most vulnerable and the most affected right now by COVID-19. Trade and food safety standards, which are essential to allow the flow, the flow and the movement of goods from countries that need, that have surpluses to countries that need boosting the smallholder resilience for recovery. So it's not only being prepared for the shocks, but also know how to handle the shocks, preventing the next zoonotic pandemic and the food system transformation. These are the core seven priority areas we're trying to work so that we can help in this building back better. Now, the challenge on African LDCs for food systems because of COVID-19 
is that the situation is exacerbated. We will see more acute food insecurity. We will see more situations of international community affected. We will see the presence of more extreme weather conditions because of climate change, more insecurity and more conflict. And we know from our previous work from the SOFI 2017, 2018, that both conflict and extreme weather conditions, as well as economic slowdowns and downturns, increase substantially the level of undernourishment. So it's not just COVID-19, we have to put in the context of the situation that we were already facing, but COVID-19 has exacerbated that situation. At the same time, there are big challenges on the, on the, of the food systems in the African least developed countries. First, we have a rapid growth in incomes and urbanization. The transforming African food systems and giving rise to new opportunities along the value chain, but also creating this youth amount of labor force of youth, which if we don't find ways to create jobs and attract that labor supply with new jobs on the labor demand side in the rural areas, we will have significant levels of, unemplo of unemployment. We need to upgrade physical and social infrastructure. That's the only way we can boost future capacity to create wealth. We need to bolster vulnerable groups, and that's where social protection which Africa used to be the continent with the less level of preparedness in terms of social protection programs in difference, for example, to Latin America. We need to boost that. We need to create institutionality so that we can support the most vulnerable, but at the same way, finding transitions moving out of them to a more sustainable growth and development. And we need better data to understand where are the problems, where is the exclusion, where are the vulnerabilities. That's why we are putting a huge effort in increasing our fees, food insecurity scale, experience scale, so that we can collect real-time data and see where people are in the worst situations of hunger. And that will help us and benefit growth, but growth with inclusion, our share equality, which is our major goal too. Now, which are the major relevant analytical frameworks that we have been focusing? The first relevant is resilience. One of the things that we learned from COVID-19 is that we need to work on resilience. And this implies two things. One is we need to be ready to understand when the shocks will occur. And remember, uncertainty, we don't know the potential effects like in COVID-19. And for that, we need very early warning tools that have predictive power. We need to look into one health approach. We need to have insurance tools. But the second is how to cope once the shocks occur. And for that, we need to have the overarching goal of, of a framework for tangible collective outcomes that brings together all involved actors. In the short term, we need to anticipate and respond and recover from imminent or current shocks and disasters. But in the long term, we need to assure that we can secure development, medium-term outcomes, and long-term development. So not only be prepared for the shock and know and have early warning systems, but also find ways in which we can cope better with those shocks. That is what resilience will mean at the end of the life. Now, inclusivity is central. And for inclusivity, we need to have access to technology. We need to have access to financial services, a major constraint of the LDCs. We need to have access to other income sources. Land, we need to have property rights of land, access to markets, access to agricultural training and information. And today we know technology is playing a crucial role. That's the only way it will be inclusive. inclusive. But there are two other elements that we need to bring up, which are access to education, access to human capital, so that it's ready and we can have the match between the labor supply and the labor demand, but also access to infrastructure. Those are central, and we need to bring both together. If not, we are not going to achieve this inclusion and growth this inclusion. We know that improvement in access to education and improving access to infrastructure will reduce inequalities, and that's what we are aiming in this process. What are our recommendations and actions? First, we need to think on an inclusive process, and that requires also to look at governance and institutionality and human capital. We need to look at national to local. Is every country, every part of the country, even within a country have differences? And we need to be context specific. Of course, there are policies that we can generalize, but we need also to contextualize them. We need to target and tailor the marginalized populations. And we need to help them and give them opportunities. We need to have early detection, identify the needs of marginalized people early on and give them the voice in research and policy and program design. And finally, we need recognition, recognize the contributions that excluded people already make to food systems with their time, labor, through policies that empower them to secure more equal benefits. We have developed a, a program called Ag Invest Initiative, which is a success story on our side. Why? Because we look at value chains, we look at the contribution of the value chains, we identify bottlenecks and we try to resolve the problems and link to the financial system. This is a core program within the Hand in Hand Initiative which is also looking at how to target and prioritize locations within the territory. 
So we are looking at areas where there is agricultural potential and where we can make a difference through Agri-Invest and through other initiatives that will resolve and bring the private sector to resolve the bottlenecks and try to find solutions so that we can link these areas where there is a lot of poverty, but significant potential. The idea here is also to find sustainable value chain development. And that means return to asset to owners, wage and incomes, thinking on reducing exclusion, benefit to consumers, tax revenues for the countries and impact over environment. That's the only way we will have sustainability, economic, social and environmental. Remember again, the food system approach brings the trade-offs and sustainability has these three elements, economic, social and environmental. If we don't bring the three, we are not being sustainable. And for that, we need to understand the trade-offs and the synergies so that we can optimize them. Now, also it's important to look at a broad array of infrastructure investments, as I mentioned before, along the entire value chain, especially target to nutritious food, because that's a challenge. We want people to have access to healthy diets. And here is where reduction of losses and waste plays a crucial importance. We need to improve uh, storage. We need to bring technologies to handle and storage and processing. We need to bring market infrastructure, not only roads and electricity, for sure, but we also need to bring value chain infrastructure. And we also need to improve the processing technology, invest in agricultural production and in the standards. For example, let me give you a, a, what we are doing right now together with Rabobank and the World Bank. We are trying to identify, in this case, we are showing Kenya, using all the geo, geospatial information we have collected in our hand in hand geospatial platform, where are the locations in Kenya where a cooling value, a cooling storage facility will create the biggest impact. Why? Because we know what is being produced, where are the farmers, we know where is the connectivity, where is the roads, where, the, where is the internet access, where is the energy. And that allows us to create a network of mobile storage facilities, cooling storage facilities, and we can centralize them and bring the commodities. This will give the farmers more resilience because they will be able to store and extend the length of their produce shelf life for a period longer than the shorter which allows them to better cope with price volatility and with risk. This project is aiming to identify exact locations, the red points here and the blue points, where these storage facilities can be, but we are also linking the storage facilities to warehouse receipt systems, but with an innovation. It's not the traditional one for staples. Here, we want to link them with, through electronic tickets, which are linked to the financial system. So we are bringing several solutions in one, staying the length, of the storage of the, of, of the shelf life of the produce, giving them more resilience and capacity to get better profits from the produce, reduce losses because these are high value commodities and now they can be stored in cooling facilities, access to markets because this e-commerce platform through the warehouse platform can create better access to markets and also access to finance because the electronic tickets from the warehouse can be given in guarantee to get liquidity for the farmers for the next season. That is how we need to think we need to think on a comprehensive approach that resolves the problems of the farmers they are facing. We also need to put policies and public investment in infrastructure, which are critical to address. For example, because of the climate change, climate-proof infrastructure solutions, repair damage infrastructure for climate-related disasters, repair damage infrastructure for conflict, and infrastructure investment in conflict areas. That's where we need support to be able to build this, but again, take the opportunity to build back better resolve for once and for all a structural problems that we have, like the lack of calling storage facilities or accessibility to markets. Let me conclude by saying the following. Food system policies can be tailored to both address the challenges and seize new opportunities. Ensuring inclusive capacity building for vulnerable groups to benefit from innovations such as healthy value chains and information and communications technology revolution are central. We know the digital technologies can do a difference, but they are just a mean. We need to have all the elements behind, content, capability, and connectivity. If we don't have those elements, then digital technologies won't do the work. Territorial approaches such as agroindustrial parks and our hand-in-hand -hand approach can bring and prioritize actions to become cost-effective and can allow us to target and identify bottlenecks and do investment plans to attract the private sector and to work with the governments to, -blend, to blend or to facilitate that process. Policy makers and program designers can similarly ensure that excluded people are represented in all the stages of the police intervention, design and implementation and evaluation, as well as the decision making of institutions. That's why in our new strategic framework, we believe that it's not only data, innovation and technology, but also what we call complements, governance, institutionality and human capital development. If we continue to pioneer new ideas, we can decide the food systems 
that can consider the different trade-offs to build back better. The trade-offs are need to be understood so that we can make the proper decisions to resolve our problems. Thank you very much for your time. And again, I am sorry I couldn't be with you today, but it has been a pleasure to be able to do these introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Maximo, for that uh, very comprehensive presentation. Uh, I'm sure a copy of the presentation will be made available uh, to participants. Uh, it has been very uh, broad presentation uh, covering a lot of uh, areas. Um, what Maximo uh, was uh, sharing with us is like uh, um, right from uh, outlining the major challenges that uh, LDCs in Africa uh, are facing uh, towards uh, identifying areas for action. Uh, and uh, now when we move towards the, uh, uh, the panel, I'm sure we'll be able to hear experiences from countries, from partners uh, on how these are actually uh, taking place on the ground. Uh, it is an honor for me to uh, now to introduce the uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, as I said uh, at the beginning, we are joined by honorable ministers uh, of member states, uh, development partners, uh, and also from farmers organization. Uh, we have amongst ourselves, amongst us, honorable Vincent Bamulangaki Semjija, uh, the minister of agriculture, animal industry and fisheries, the Republic of Uganda. We also have uh, amongst us Honorable Lobin Lowe, uh, who is the Minister of Agriculture of the Republic of Malawi. Uh, we also have amongst us His, His Excellency uh, uh, Ato Umar Hussein, the Minister of Agriculture of the uh, Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, Ms. Sara Mbago Bunu, uh, who is the director of uh, IFAD uh, in, for East and Southern Africa Division. Uh, we also have uh, Ms. Elizabeth Nsimadala, the president of the Pan African Farmers Organization, PAFO. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, uh, who is uh, the president of AGRA, as we know her, as well as the United Nations Secretary General's special envoy to the 2021 Food Systems Summit. So uh, you will expect that this is going to be uh, a very uh, engaging, high level, uh, interactive discussion. Let me start uh, from Honorable Minister of Uganda, Honorable Vincent Bamulangaki Sempija, uh, to just kick, kick off the discussion. Now, uh, can you hear me? Let, let me? let me ask you one question. Uh, can you hear me, Honorable Minister? I'm getting you clearly, but I Very don't good. know whether you are. Very good. I, I want to, I want to uh, ask a question. We know the focus is, uh, you know, creating and maintaining inclusive, sustainable, and resilient food systems. This is the focus. And from the presentation made by uh, my colleague Maximo, uh, we, we need to look at it in a systemic uh, perspective in an inclusive manner. We know that uh, there are so many actors and stakeholders uh, along the whole value chain. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we have all ministers here, ministers of agriculture, uh, whether it includes animal industry, fisheries, still in the broader sense of the term. How, how are you addressing this multi-sectoral nature of the issue? Because uh, Maximo was talking about infrastructure, for example. Uh, without addressing the issues of infrastructure, 
then we can't achieve the food and agriculture systems transformation. So what are the top issues uh, that in your country you are addressing to create uh, and maintain inclusive, sustainable, and resilient food systems. Let's start from the Honorable Minister of Uganda, and then I will uh, ask more or less the same question to the Honorable Minister of Malawi. Honorable Minister, over to you. Thank you very much, moderator, my brother. Uh, I want to greet our brothers and sisters listening in, but also allow me to salute the, the, Your Excellency, the Honorable Ministers, and uh, everybody who has really contributed to this very wonderful session. I want to thank you very much for including, uh, for the organizers, for including Uganda today. And uh, I want to say that uh, uh, the, our previous speaker has be given us a very good insight of what we want to talk about. For this country, Uganda, as you know, our, we want to achieve our vision 2040 of a transformed Ugandan society from a peasant to a modern and prosperous country by 2040. Uh, we are tackling many areas, but agriculture is a priority, has been taken as a major priority area to transform our country to a modern society. Uh, to answer the question straight, we are looking at a multifaceted program where many stakeholders, especially the sectors that are concerned with infrastructure, especially the Ministry of Work, Housing and Urban Development, the Ministry of Water and Environment, the Ministry of Health, the Minister of Local Government, the Minister of the Minister of Trade and Industry. Those are the major sectors. The Minister of Education, and of course the Minister of Security. All of these work together to make sure that uh, our people are served, and we answer the question of inclusiveness which is a very big question. Inclusive, of course, to me and to others, inclusiveness, fairness, gender sensitive, sensitivity, balanced development, food and the nutrition security for all are very important aspects if we want to talk about and also eradicate inequalities. So we have started a program approach in this country as opposed to sector planning systems that we have always been following. That means that uh, all these sectors must work together to make sure that we improve on the farm access roads, the farm access roads, we access our farmers with the water for production. We access our farmers with mechanization and uh, using, you know, we help our women and the youth to get involved in agriculture, to be interested in agriculture by mechanizing agriculture. And we have a whole program for agro-industrialization agro headed by the Ministry of Agriculture. It has all the sectors, about 15 sectors that are working together because we are following a program approach instead of 
small plans by sector instead of the disjointed planning that we have been following all along. Now it is working together as sectors to make sure that the goals of agro-industrialization, the goals of nutrition and, and food security are approached and achieved together. So that is how we are approaching the, the whole question. Thank you so much, Honorable. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, and, Thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much, my brother. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. I'm sincerely grateful to be uh, with you again. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I remember last time we met was in Uganda. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you for your commitment and leadership. A very, uh, very uh, rich. Uh, feedback because this Thank issue. Thank you very much. I want to assure my brothers and sisters who are listening in, who are part of uh, this uh, uh, chat, uh, this uh, debate, that uh, we, even during this COVID 19, during this problem of COVID 19, Uganda has had food surplus. We have enough food to feed our people, we are also, uh, and we are also uh, feeding our neighbors, the region. So this is something that cannot be underestimated, but the whole thing is following a program approach where everybody is together. Infrastructure, the roads, the Ministry of Works must do, uh, must implement pro projects that are aimed at getting access to the farmers. Farmers must access the market and health must be there to make sure that our farmers are healthy. We are implementing a very important project called uh, uh, the, the Uganda Multisectoral Food Security and Nutrition Project. All of these sectors are playing a part. This is Minnesota Health. Minister of Local Government, Minister of Education, and the Minister of Agriculture is the leading, and the animal industry is the leading sector. So we, we, following such approach, we are now achieving together. It's no longer pointing fingers to one sector or the other. We are losing together and succeeding together. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. I may come back again on the surplus uh, production. I must congratulate you for that uh, in relation to the uh, pan the uh, AFCFTA and the opportunities that uh, there are. But let me now uh, invite Honorable uh, Lobin Lowy, uh, the minister uh, from Malawi. Uh, Honorable minister, if you have heard uh, the questions that I've asked the Honorable Minister of Uganda, uh, I want to ask you also to give us, to, to share experiences from Malawi on, on, on how you are addressing this, uh, this issue uh, of you know, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient food systems in Malawi. Over to you, Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you so much, moderator, uh, honorable ministers, distinguished dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, agriculture still remains the main source of uh, livelihoods for a large sector or section of our population in the LOTCs. As such, any production shocks negatively impact on uh, food security and nutrition status of an already very vulnerable population. The present COVID-19 pandemic has actually revealed how fragile uh, our food systems are, calling for a serious reflection by all stakeholders. And if you ask uh, top issues that my country is addressing, I will start with uh, uh, agriculture research and uh, extension. This is a very, these are very critical. And as a country, 
they are one of the priorities and we are investing a lot into this. Another issue is um, to improve efficiency of agricultural output and uh, input markets. Third issue is irrigation development. Malawi actually relies very much on late-grade agriculture, but uh, we are going with some reforms. So we are now investing a lot in irrigation. We have uh, massive uh, projects. You may wish to know that uh, part of the section of Malawi, that is lower Shire, each year is affected by drought. So what we have done is uh, to invest a lot in, in irrigation. We have come up with a Shire Valley transformation project. We are creating or we are constructing a big canal which will cover over 40 kilometers. And farmers along that canal will not rely on rain fed anymore. And this is a great achievement for the country. Another if is uh, infrastructure development for inputs and output market. Uh, you may wish to know that uh, we have a training market which is public. It, uh, it almost collapsed. And what we have done is to make sure that uh, we revamp this market grain, grain market. And as I'm talking, uh, it will be a control because uh, all along uh, private traders will control the market and it will use it to the advantage of, to disadvantage of farmers. But uh, with this uh, uh, grain market, uh, we are trying to empower it, that is financially and with some infrastructure. So, Farmers will benefit because we will start uh, purchasing the produce as early as possible compared to what we have experienced for some time. And uh, when you talk of uh, food surplus, you may wish to know that as a country, we have a program, uh, input, the affordable inputs program. My country invested a lot in this program. And uh, we actually targeted the step of food, which is maize. And you may wish to know that we targeted the almost all farming families. And we have uh, covered 91% of them. And we have surplus. And I would like the region to know Malawi has a lot of maize. And uh, we are ready to export to any country where there is demand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for uh, sharing very, uh, uh, very rich uh, experiences from Malawi. Again, uh, very happy to hear that Malawi uh, is also having surpluses in maize. Uh, this is what we want to achieve as a region as in Africa. Uh, and uh, also, um, to, to transform the product itself, you know, instead of uh, looking for uh, exporting uh, maize as as raw maize, uh, we could process it at value and uh, and then benefit uh, all the stakeholders uh, along. It. I'm sure Malawi is considering this. Uh, we will come back to these kind of uh, very important issues, but then uh, let's uh, also hear from. Uh, uh, another honorable minister, His Excellency uh, Umar Hussein, the Minister of Agriculture from Ethiopia. You are most welcome, uh, Your Excellency, uh, and we're very happy that you have joined us. Uh, you, have, you, have, you have heard uh, the uh, interventions from the honorable ministers uh, of Uganda and Malawi. You can add uh, the experiences from Ethiopia, but also I, I want you to share with us uh, a little bit additional perspective. Uh, now, the, 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 the honorable ministers touched on how they empower farmers uh, also. We know that the food value chain uh, involves a lot of stakeholders, you know, along the farm to fork spectrum. 
uh, including even consumers. Um, and so how can these stakeholders uh, who sometimes uh, have differing or even competing points of view, how can they contribute to solutions? Government has its own strategy, investments and so on, but there are important stakeholders. I mean, the farmers, I will of course uh, uh, ask later on the president of the Pan-African Farmers uh, Forum, uh, but how, 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 is, how are you working with the different stakeholders towards coming up with uh, a solution uh, to which uh, everybody can commit and, and contribute? Your Excellency. Thank you so much, Abebe, the moderator of uh, today's program. Uh, I'm also pleased to be a part of this discussion in which most of our African country, you know, come up with the solution for our problems. And then we learn from each other a lot. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I get a lot of points from the previous speakers, as you mentioned. Uh, as you all know, this year, uh, the Eastern part, likely from the continent, has been affected by a lot of challenge, uh, maybe different from the other. Locusts and the fillet are, you know, on top of, you know, uh, our problem, which we have in hand, like COVID pandemic, which is common for all of us. Uh, however, uh, you know, having this whole problem still, as mentioned by uh, honorable ministers, uh, uh, there is also positive growth in Ethiopia also from agriculture side. Uh, we didn't expect that even uh, a lot of effort has been made to maintain that positive growth uh, in agriculture. Specifically, uh, the newly strategic policy intervention from our side is devised, which is highly focusing on, you know, devising a business model uh, for agriculture. As you all know, agriculture is one of the key area uh, of the economic contribution in our country. Uh, and it's also a source of unemployment. Uh, in that regard, the first thing the government did in the policy uh, redesigning was looking to the public-private partnership. Uh, as you all know, most of our uh, agricultural activity is undertaken by smallholder farmers, which accounts more than 80%, as you know, everybody know. But you know, having the land, enough land in the water in the lowland area, we try to introduce the public-private partnership and encourage the private sector in precision agriculture, smart farming, which includes even urban agriculture, newly introduced in the last two years agri-product marketing and agri-financing. Most likely in the financing, uh, currently Ethiopian government come up with a new approach in which the farmers can get access to finance without fixed asset collateral. Even the movable assets uh, can be taken as a collateral for the farmers. Uh, they can have their uh, crops or live animal and the, the land certificate for the uh, you know loan that they get from the banks. These are some of the area in which we are uh, in highly engaged. As mentioned earlier by my colleague, agromechanization is also one of the focus area because uh, here in Ethiopia and uh, maybe which will hold for the other African country too, the major part of agricultural problem is the production side. If we want to increase the production side, which is accompanied by the post-harvest laws, to address those problems, we need to mechanize, modernize our agriculture. That's an area where, you know, our government uh, getting focused and uh, for any item which used for the production of agriculture get a tax holiday in the country, which, are, which includes around 515 items, very big items, list from highly mechanized to the small level of machineries. 
uh, agricultural fin financial inclusion is also one of the issue which I mentioned earlier. The other one is the cluster farming. As you all know, I don't know the other part of Africa very well, but in our case, uh, the average land holding goes to even less than a hectare in some part of the country. In that case, we can't come up with the productivity level or production level of that we need. So we uh, introduce through uh, agricultural transformation agency, the cluster approach in which the farmers comes together and they bring their land together, which is adjacent to each other and they introduce the whole extension service in introduction of technology. Uh, no one left behind uh, in that area. That took around 25 to 30% of our farms these days, because every year we are, you know, in one season, we can have around 13 to 14 million hectare uh, under production. But out of that, around 30% will be covered by this cluster, cluster approach. You know, we introduce a program based cluster uh, for, so that, you know, we, we don't have a mix of production in that area, uh, focusing on the major crops. The other one is the introduction of, you know, agro-industrial park, which may be held in the other part of the country, the, the other countries also. Uh, this is also an area in which we intervene to uh, solve the problem of this fragmented market approach in which there is a long chain of markets, which does not really benefit the farmers automatically. The other one is the diversification in production. You know, mostly we focus on very few food groups uh, or crops. We try to diversify this one also based on, you know, the cooperative advantage the country have. I believe whenever we talk about sustainability, no agriculture sustainability without environment. That's why Ethiopian government focus on, you know, tree planting every year, which is in billion, uh, and agriculture would take that initiative uh, together with the Environment Commission uh, so that we can have a good environment for our future. In general, we need to think about the whole value chain whenever we talk about agriculture. In our case, we try to see the production side, which need focus, so that we can feed our, uh, you know, population, which is maybe uh, very big in number, more than 100 million so far these days, and the market value chain in which we are highly inefficient. This includes the, as mentioned by the first speaker, the construction of the, you know, infrastructure, which is very poor these days. We introduce also the, the data management system in which the extension workers, which is more than 17,000 as a village level, can access the data so that they can easily pass the data using the tablet to the central uh, database. Finally, back to your final question, you know, the stakeholders role. By the way, in, the, in, in, in our case, we try to create a seamless approach uh, among the ministries. Uh, there is no such, you know, binding rule in the conflicting interest unless, you know, we, everybody look for uh, common uh, personal interest. In our case, uh, we don't have much problem to integrate, but as far as the agriculture sector is concerned, including the policy, we try to, you know, cooperate with the other ministries, starting from the one who is allocating the budget with good reason, up to the private sector, uh, as well as uh, uh, the, the, the scholars who has a good contribution in this sector. So that way we are trying to coordinate. As far as agriculture sector is concerned, it's me as a ministry who is coordinating this sector. But as mentioned earlier by my colleague from Ghana, it's a program approach. We have a platform in which we meet. For instance, for export, we have a platform. For cluster, which I mentioned earlier, we have a platform. Again, uh, uh, we, as far as the mechanization is concerned, we have the same platform in which we can meet and discuss. 
That way we are trying to manage. That does not mean, you know, everything is done well, but there are a lot of challenge. As, uh, as you know, agriculture is highly risky business and uh, the post-harvest loss is one of the challenge, which maybe holds in the other part of the country. Thank you so much. These are some of the points I wanted to make. If there is any question, I will be back. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, for this very, uh, very, uh, very rich uh, contribution of experience sharing. Uh, I know if we had uh, time to uh, give uh, similar opportunities to other honorable ministers from other countries, uh, they will be uh, very glad to share their experiences, which, which is very, very rich, which uh, leads me to uh, um, another initiative uh, that the Director General of FAO has uh, introduced and actually has uh, made, has offered, uh, and that is to promote uh, commodities and, you know, from each country, uh, the commodity they believe is so strategic and that they are doing well, they can, FAO can help them to promote that commodity globally using FAO's platform. So these are uh, some of the examples. It's rich, uh, you know, uh, I'm so happy to hear uh, experiences from uh, our member states. Now, uh, you talked about uh, uh, financial inclusion uh, from the Ethiopian experience. And um, I, I want to relate to um, the next uh, uh, panelist, uh, my colleague, Sarah Mbangobuhu, who is uh, uh, from IFAD. Uh, she's director of East and Southern Africa Division. Uh, now we know IFAD, it's a UN agency. Uh, we work together. Uh, but also IFAD is, uh, um, you know, international financial institution. It works with uh, other international financial institutions, uh, private sector, with member states, uh, and, and so on. Uh, Sarah, you have heard uh, very interesting stories from the honorable ministers, uh, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the countries. We know these are not the only ones. Uh, so how can you tell us uh, if there are success stories in, in agri-food systems uh, from your, your perspective. Sarah, over to you. What a challenging uh, and, and very important question. Uh, Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers of Agriculture, distinguished panelists, uh, UN Special Envoy for the UN Food System Summit, uh, Dr. Karibata, and thank you, uh, Dr. Bebe, uh, our sister agency, FAO. You um, really give me a challenging question to talk about uh, successes and the partnerships. And uh, to try and link this uh, to the very first presentation we heard around the current uh, food situation uh, that is facing us. And having heard from the honorable ministers, all of whom are distinguished uh, partners of IFAD, and we were Uh, agenda and visions. And uh, fortunately, I can say, uh, safely say that there are a, a number of um, successes. Already, uh, the Honorable Minister from Uganda has talked about how multi-sector programming and even the Minister for Ethiopia is building uh, results. Uh, for instance, uh, IFAD is supporting the whole platform for water efficiency uh, discussion and use, looking at the water scarcity a challenge that is facing Ethiopia, and uh, even stimulating the South-South uh, types of exchanges for learning um, and working closely with, with, with FAO as well on this uh, transfer of knowledge agenda where we have gone uh, with the participants, uh, stakeholders from, uh, from Ethiopia to Kenya, and uh, Kenyans have gone back to Ethiopia to really exchange on how water is governed, what water policies are being used, and then trying to roll out a blueprint around water and the importance of using groundwater, uh, green water, blue water more efficiently uh, to really boost productivity 
and reduce uh, dependency on rainwater is just one uh, of those, uh, you know, one of those exciting things that we're seeing coming out of the engagements that we have, not only with the Rome based agencies, but with other important actors. And, and before I get really into um, some of those things that really need to change and some of the solutions uh, that we have found, uh, I, I really do want to emphasize uh, just some of the points that have already been raised. Uh, around you know the food system being the entire value chain, and it's really also around what it can deliver in terms of sustainable jobs, in terms of sustainable production in the ecosystem, in terms of resilience, in terms of improved nutrition. I think this is why why the UN is here, and we see so much opportunities in Africa to be able to stimulate and advance that agenda. Uh, for uh, equitable livelihoods, for the attainment of the sustainable development goals, and for a joint prosperity uh, and actually a wider sustainability, uh, looking at the One Health, One Planet uh, agenda. So I think this is important. Now, uh, that said, I think we are faced with a huge challenge, and I think it was raised by the Honorable Minister from Ethiopia. Uh, and the fact is, is that the resources for this transformation agenda are limited. And particularly in the face of COVID, we see fiscal distress for many countries. A few ministers are here. They're engaging the ministers of finance. Uh, they need to crowd in enough resources to build resilience for an adaptation to the climate crisis, also dealing with COVID, has been commendable. I really think these efforts have been commendable so far. And I think some of the examples towards that uh, demonstrated in, 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 a, in a bid to try and crowd in more development finance. Uh, I think what, what I would recommend and what we see is that, yes, uh, the use of uh, land use and really, really looking at new land use uh, patterns and tenures can really hold uh, and improve security. We have seen how this transformation is really helpful in Senegal. We have seen how land tenure systems really promote uh, uh, security and promote investment for farmers in Ghana and also in, in, in parts of, of Uganda and, and, and Kenya. So we're seeing that that part is also very important in terms of when we talk about climate. It's not only uh, about small irrigation or relevant irrigation schemes to reduce dependency on rainfall, but it's also around those governance systems that can move the field. We also know that when we improve our farming practices, for instance, if we reduce no, introduce no-till agriculture for those uh, smallholders who are already uh, commercial and better targeting of fertilizer application, we know this contributes to the fight against global warming. And there we have very good examples coming from Southern Africa, uh, from the Botswana's, from South Africa itself, uh, from your Namibia's, where these approaches have been adopted uh, successfully and they're reducing carbon pollution by up to 18%. Um, having said that, in other, in other countries where there is maybe less access to finance, and I'll get to talking a little bit about that, the use, for instance, of nitrogen fixing um, commodities, helping uh, in improving soil quality and adding nutrients to farmland, just through simple technologies where agriculture extension works. So for instance, in Ethiopia, with Agriculture Transformation Agency, we have seen enormous uh, benefits of those systems. In Zambia today, we have digitized, uh, as the minister talked about, and uh, we're trying to it's sent together with the, with the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Livestock, two separate ministries, uh, the introduction of uh, specific uh, uh, technical messages around animal husbandry, around crop management for management of disease. And, uh, and with World Food Program, we're also introducing uh, tools for um, livestock index insurance, just to build on the resilience that uh, the resilience question, the management of risk raised by the Honorable Minister from Malawi. So, so we are seeing quite a lot of good things when we talk about uh, uh, you making the best use of the climate finance uh, that is there. 
uh, we can really get a lot. And I want to also just say that, uh, you know, one unfortunate thing is we have had quite a lot of research on the African continent, uh, ID on new technologies. Uh, unfortunately, it's been crowded around maize. And the, the minister from Malawi talked about maize, but there's vast opportunities to boost the research budget. And I use this forum to really implore that so that we can have more nutrient-dense crops uh, being introduced. We've had success in the uh, yellow flesh potato that is really emerging, uh, some cassava uh, variants, which are you know, uh, bio-enriched, uh, that are giving ground in, in DRC and places where nutrition gains are really struggling. Uh, but we need more crowding in there. Right now, only 2% of climate uh, finance is for adaptation that gets into the hands of smallholder farmers. And I think this is too little. So these forums and others should be platforms for advocating. And also, as we have the ministers here, I know there is a fiscal pressure, but how can we reduce the resources that we spend on food imports and divert those funds really to agricultural transformation agenda and uh, the support of, of, of rural zones in particular. Now, um, my second point, and I have a final third point that I want to use uh, to stress here, the successes, we see that uh, many smallholder farmers in rural areas are very marginalized. They're not incentivized to increase productivity. And I think all the ministers have mentioned that. But we have seen where we are introducing uh, instruments like a payment for ecosystem services, because today we only, in, we only recognize the role that smallholders farmers play in the production of food, that we don't recognize or even reward them for essential environmental services they provide. So for instance, uh, pollination, pest control, regulation of soil fertility, uh, carbon sequestering, erosion control, water management, all of these are really services that smallholder farmers are playing. We should try and incentivize them and also provide pricing for their outputs, which creates win-win and, and really say you're part of uh, the solution in terms of feeding uh, the current and future generations. Uh, we also need to ensure that they um, are able to have secure markets. So how can we open up these urban markets? I think you mentioned Dr. Webe, you know, the opportunities of the, uh, the Africa free trade continental area. I think there's lots there that could, could happen. Uh, we've also talked about the need to reform our marketing and distribution systems. The studies that show run by FAO that the price of food in, in our urban, growing urban areas is so much higher because with inefficiencies in these open traditional markets that we value so much, uh, we need to invest there, upgrade them so that they can be accessible to all and reduce costs in the logistics. And, and linked to this is also changing the blueprint of how we govern food markets. Uh, I allude to this because really many of those uh, open markets are governed by local authorities. They don't reinvest in those systems. At times they divert resources to other important needs, I understand. But uh, even uh, how we issue our import licenses and so on, if we can create new rules of the game and use the rebuilding back from COVID better, that would be excellent. And my, uh, let's say my last final big cohort around success stories, uh, the Minister of Ethiopia also mentioned this, and I think as well from Malawi, that the backbone of agriculture food systems in most of Africa are the agri SMEs. And here there is huge unmet demand for credit and finance. Uh, there's three or four things that spring out. The finance, if it's there, it's highly un unaffordable. Um, the, the gap for the types of financial services is largely a met 100 billion annually is, is, is required. This is huge and 100 million for smallholder farmers. Um, this, without access to finance, they cannot adopt the technologies that are out there. They will not be able to make the necessary investments to transform agriculture. So there are solutions there. We see now, you know, the FinTech uh, hub in East Africa, in, in Kenya offers fantastic uh, opportunities. We see mobile money uh, coming in and reducing the cost of actually providing essential uh, financial uh, offerings uh, to the agri SMEs. We have de-risking guarantee schemes with financial banks and financial institutions. Uh, the minister mentioned financial inclusion 
programs in Ethiopia really working with SACOS and other rural uh, entities to get the, the resources out there. I think data is a very important part of this piece, but also bringing different stakeholders to be able to really ensure that the agri-SMEs that are providing transport services, storage services, warehousing services, even uh, education and extension services in some instances uh, are really able to get the cash flow or the capital resources to really invest and adopt new technologies. Um, really, this, this is very key and digital is part of the rural transformation. If you put digital at the heart together with people, uh, young people driving it, I think this is where we can see changes and we see changes in the urban agricultural space across Tanzania, uh, across Rwanda, we really see the emergence of a new type of commercial actor who is willing and able to produce sustainably. I think those are some of the, the, the wins that we see. So how can we build on this, these experiences and make sure that they're widely, they're widely shared? I, I, I perhaps stop there, uh, uh, Abebe, and, uh, and, and pass uh, the floor over to you. But I think really there's a couple of key, key points that we need to take on board, and I'm so excited to be here with uh, our esteemed ministers who talk to us uh, all the time. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Sir. Uh, has been quite mouthful, actually. You have you have given us a lot of uh, uh, information uh, from policy to uh, governance to investment to uh, some specific examples. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, but at some point, you you when I hear you, I thought I was hearing from a farmer. Uh, the way you made a very strong advocacy on behalf of, uh, you know, provision of incentives. Uh, you used the example of uh, payment for ecosystem services, but the whole incentive, the whole of incentives. You know, why why should uh, whether it is a farmer or an investor or an innovator or even a policymaker like the minister of finance, why should they invest in agriculture? How do we convince them? You know, it, it, it's not um, like a charity. It's, a, it's an important economic activity. And when they make an investment, it's a commitment. They must get some benefit out of it. And that is how I think um, I understood it, uh, which really serves as a bridge now to go to the next distinguished panelist. I had uh, considered initially to give uh, Miss Elizabeth uh, Nsimadala, who is the president of the F Pan African Farmers Organization, to actually uh, to, to give her the, the the chance to speak first before even the honourable ministers uh, and, and and Sarah spoke, um, to try to see what the demand side of the story would look like before we talk about what is on the offer. But then finally, I said to myself. No, I think farmers, of course, we're talking uh, on, on their behalf, you know, the whole of it. Um, you know, honorable ministers, they emphasized that unless we produce, th the rest of it is really meaningless. We have to have, we have to produce enough, of course, along the whole value chain. But then without the farmers and in a broader sense, the farmers also, they, they, whenever we're talking about investments, it's, they're key stakeholders. So I want uh, Miss Elizabeth to listen to the perspectives from the policymakers, the honorable ministers, the partners, and then make reflection on the basis of that. So uh, Miss Elizabeth, I, I would like to ask you, uh, of course, you are free to kind of reflect on the base of what you have heard so far, but you have now two cups. One, you are representing farmers uh, organization and so you are like a voice of the farmers organization do you feel that your voice you have an articulate voice a voice that needs to be heard do you think that your voice is represented and if if not what do you think should be done secondly again as as uh, you know president of bafo what are you doing you know what to towards the solution 
So what are the key areas of the focus of PAFO and its network organizations towards contributing to the solution as an important stakeholder? Over to you, Ms. Elizabeth Simadala. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bebe. But my, my connection is a bit um, weak. So I will request that I unmute the video. At least I have a profile picture that can be displayed on the screen. OK, that would be fine. So uh, distinguished uh, excellencies, uh, honorable ministers, our UN uh, special envoy, Dr. Agnes, and uh, other fellow participants. Uh, I want to appreciate uh, FAO for really giving us this opportunity. And I feel uh, the discussions that we are having today, especially on the food systems in low and middle income countries are very timely because we all know that uh, the low and middle income countries are experiencing a radical transition in response to socioeconomic and demographic challenges. Uh, people are very conscious now of nutrition. And if we, if we are talking of food systems, then there is no way we can leave out um, farmers. We are important uh, stakeholders when it comes to such discussions. Uh, I want to appreciate the previous speakers, the honorable ministers, Dr. Sarah. I think you made uh, a, a comment that Sarah is, uh, looked like she was speaking on behalf of the farmers. And I want to reassure you that um, from the farmer's perspective, we really uh, regard uh, UN agencies, FAO, IFAD as, 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 as co-partners because you've made us who we are. Nobody was able to listen to us, but today we also sit around tables and make sure that our voices are heard. And this is because of the support that we are getting from institutions like FAO, from IFAD, because we really work with you the journey, for example, for IFAD when they are transforming rural lives. You cannot uh, talk of transforming rural lives unless you've given priority to the farmers. So uh, back to the question on whether we feel um, our voice is represented. Um, as a continental uh, platform, I think uh, our role was first to justify our relevancy as key actors in the agricultural transformation. And it is the reason we mobilized ourselves to make sure that we have one common voice that can knock on doors of every actors and stakeholders in the agricultural sector and be heard the way you're listening to us today. And we did this by mobilizing ourselves. As we speak, we, are, we represent over 80 million smallholder farmers in 49 countries. We've built partnerships with development partners, FAO, IFAD, and others. We've built partnerships with governments, listening from the ministers that have just uh, uh, you know, spoke. For example, uh, moving to Ethiopia, we have a strong Oromia Coffee Cooperative Union as our member. Moving to Malawi, we have NASFAM, that is a member of SACAO, our regional farmers organization. To Uganda, we have a new cafe, we have UCA, we have the Uganda National Farmers Federation as our members. Meaning we have strong voices down there and we've tried to really build the capacity of the continental farmers platform, the regional farmers platform, but also the national uh, level farmers platforms to be able to dialogue with uh, different um, you know, actors, with, with governments at different levels, be it at national, regional, and also at continental level. But also um, now moving back to the representation, our voice, yes, we are represented, but is it um, effective enough to make uh, the change that we want in the agriculture sector? I think that is what is very critical. And this is why we are now um, calling on a multi-stakeholder approach of how we can really together build an ecosystem where we can all contribute and leverage on each other's um, you know, um, opportunities, but also learn from others' weaknesses and be able to walk the journey together in terms of transforming the agriculture sector in Africa and across, but also um, uh, transforming uh, our food systems. So what is um, 
the solution. What are what are what do we have uh, in our dockets? What are we working on uh, in terms of um, uh, our focus uh, at, at continental level um, and at regional level? Because our strategic direction now is geared toward economic services, and uh, by economic services we are looking at trying to empower ourselves as farmers to be key actors across the entire value chain. And we are doing that by strengthening, again, the capacity of our membership. We are doing that by focusing on a value chain approach where we identify priority and profitable value chains and we focus on them. We are doing that through a market-led approach looking at the markets and you know, trying to, to, to look at what the market demands and then working towards um, you know, supplying the market, sustaining the market and, 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 and ourselves becoming sustainable. But also as a, a voice of farmers, we are trying to make sure that we gather all this uh, information out there and we become a knowledge hub, making sure that um, the success stories that uh, they've been talking about, where do we find them? For example, if today you wanted to have a database of all these success stories that are happening out there, can we maybe have a link where we can click and maybe be able to get such information? So that is why we are positioning ourselves to be a knowledge hub, be able to pick all those success stories that are out there in the field and have them all together so that we can always have peer to peer learning and be able to disseminate such kind of success stories. But also in the policy and advocacy aspect, and I will combine this also with the representation, we are trying to take a center stage to, to demand for services, to demand for favorable working environment, to make sure that we are every represented. For example, now when we speak of the Food System Summit, as PAFO, we sit in the advisory committee that is making sure that uh, it gives the election to the Food System Summit 2021. But we also have our colleagues who are, for example, members of the champions, they are participating in, the, in, in different uh, action tracks and so on to make sure that really our voice is every represented. But also when you look at the recognition of women and youth that is happening across, I think for us, it is very critical for us because we know women and youth contribute uh, uh, heavily in terms of uh, transformation of the agriculture sector. They are the majority when it comes to employment in the agriculture sector. But when it comes to take back from what is produced, they usually uh, take home peanuts because uh, when it comes to the marketing aspect, it is usually the men that take a bigger share. So we are also giving priority to strengthening women and youth to be able to take part in the agriculture value chains. And lastly, uh, we can't, uh, I mean, discuss the rest minus talking about climate change and resilience. We know uh, we've all seen uh, the impact of, of COVID and how it has disrupted almost all the sectors and agriculture was never spared either. So our focus is also on climate change. We have a farmer-led, a global farmer-led uh, climate change agenda dubbed uh, the Climakers, where uh, farmer, farmer leaders, you know, farmers' organizations are taking lead in providing solutions uh, towards, uh, you know, climate change, but also positioning ourselves to be more resilient, more resilient to shocks. We, we've seen, you know, shocks happening every now and then. Uh, the other day is, is, is uh, desert locusts, more is floods. The next day is drought. COVID, you know, comes in. So we are trying to empower ourselves to be as more resilient as possible. But we cannot do this alone. That is why, again, we are calling upon uh, all the different actors in the sector to build an ecosystem where we can come up with holistic approaches of addressing, uh, you know, these challenges in a holistic manner. Thank you, and over to you, Dr. Bebe. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Simadala, for that uh, uh, very, very useful, very rich uh, in intervention. <clears throat> uh, we have a few minutes for interactive discussion. On the uh, Q&A, uh, I have seen uh, a note from um, 
a participant uh, from Somalia. He has introduced himself, Mohammed uh, from Somalia. And uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Mohammed, for your uh, uh, question. Uh, he, he's asking why Somalia was not invited uh, among the panelists. Uh, says it's one of the most productive countries in East Africa. Uh, and uh, then the next question is how can African countries be linked in terms of production? Uh, for the first question, uh, when we, uh, I think we've reached out to several countries and uh, we um, actually uh, depended on those who have uh, responded as early as possible. Uh, when FAO was, uh, uh, invited to uh, host, co-host this particular meeting. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was in a relatively short notice. So we, we, we tried to reach out to as many uh, countries uh, as possible. And as you can see, even in terms of representation, uh, Ethiopia and, and Uganda, they are from Eastern Africa region and uh, Malawi is from Southern Africa. We don't have anyone from Central and, and Western Africa um, and then, uh, so our apologies, uh, but uh, we will have more opportunities to engage uh, our member states to share experiences. Uh, as I have said, we have also platforms, flat platforms for mutual learning and experience sharing uh, among countries. But the question, uh, what, how can African countries be linked in terms of production? Um, it's a big question. It's a big question, and uh, um, the uh, I, I mentioned about the Africa Continental Free Trade uh, Area that uh, uh, came into force uh, from January one, twenty twenty one, and uh, we believe that uh, most of African countries who apparently are dependent on imports of food. You know, a lot of the, the figures, uh, the amount of uh, foreign currency that is spent on importing food items to Africa is number one, huge. Number two, it is increasing from year to year. And it doesn't make sense for most African countries to uh, continue to depend on imports, food imports, when they can really have comparative advantage in producing them. And also uh, in Africa, I think the best we can do in terms of trading amongst ourselves and being uh, a market uh, for is in the agriculture and food uh, systems. And so if you are referring to integrating production at the African level, I think it should be through trade. Countries based on their comparative advantages the, the, His, His Excellency uh, Minister uh, Umar Hussein from Ethiopia talked about the consolidation, land consolidation through a uh, cluster approach and, uh, you know, which, which, which is moving towards specialization kind of uh, territorial. So based on those comparative advantages, if Somalia produces something that is, at, you know, at a higher productive, productivity level at a cost competitive basis, then uh, it would form the basis for uh, trade amongst Afri African countries, but even beyond. Um, if there are some questions, uh, let me open the floor for more questions to come. You may, you may raise your hands. Let's make it a little bit more interactive instead of question being posed from the moderator and panelists is ask, asking. The panelists themselves can, uh, you know, interact among themselves if there are some additional points. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, I, was, I was looking at the, the Q&A section and again, uh, Usman Sene uh, also uh, wondering why Senegal has not been invited. Uh, yeah, as I said, I, I wish 
we could have, have invited we could invite uh, as many ministers as possible but uh, yeah so did i hear somebody taking the floor yes can i please yes please introduce yourself and uh, yes okay thank you so much honorable for this uh, opportunity that you gave me uh, to join you today in this wonderful panel but touching on very important highly matters for uh, uh, Africa development, especially among the LDCs, uh, specifically uh, transforming agriculture and food securities. My name is uh, Dr. Sedina uh, Sene, and I work for a national think tank called IPAR, and I'm an assistant professor at the university. Uh, I uh, collaborate personally uh, with uh, GPSDD, the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, on initiative, key initiative on data and partnership, trying to bring uh, the role of data and how it can improve uh, life via agriculture. Uh, the reason why I was asking why Senegal was not involved and was like there are key uh, advancement when it comes to really showcasing the role of data in collaboration with FAO and IFAD Senegal that really demonstrates the value of investing more in agriculture and the value also of engaging the community and building their capacity to really uh, entangle uh, the nexus between uh, 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 food security, nutrition, and uh, agricultural transformation using uh, data and AI. Uh, what I've seen so far as an evaluators on the ground was by enabling uh, today uh, um, uh, uh, stakeholders, especially communities, by giving them the voice and opportunity to learn using technology and then outsourcing data from them, I think we are creating a durable solution for them to be able to address issues of really productivity and uh, food security on the ground. And then there are many examples like that uh, in FAO project, IFAD in collaboration with the Minister of Agriculture that would be interesting to share for with other countries, especially with Honorable uh, Minister of uh, Uganda, where we really have working relationship. And I would like if there is any experience from those countries uh, the role of community engagement and really harnessing the power of artificial intelligence to really uh, bring policy evidence in improving lives. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We highly encourage that in your forum from really uh, this part of the world where researchers, policymakers, but also community are really interested in uh, what is happening internationally and what are the key decision makers and uh, recommendations that we can carry over. Uh, to really uh, uh, share the voices and concern, but also successes of other farmers around the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Osman Sene uh, from Senegal uh, for sharing that information and uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mohamed Iman Boule, uh, are you there? Over to you. Please take the floor. Mr. Mohammed Iman. Uh, okay, so uh, let's let's go to another person. Uh, has uh, Mr. S no, Honorable Minister, did you raise your hand, Honorable Minister of Uganda? Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, I wanted to comment on the question of uh, what can we do uh, make sure that uh, our food systems are adequate. This is a very, very wide subject. I want to comment Madam Sarah Mbago, because she touched many areas, which are really policy areas, very, very important policy area, which we need to look at. Uh, as we talk about uh, food systems, we are talking about a whole range from the farmer, from production. We are talking about improving the productivity. We are talking about the whole value chain through post-harvest handling or even harvest handling 
post harvest handling. And then we need to talk about storage, agro processing. That is why, as uh, I mentioned earlier, that uh, uh, Uganda, we decided to follow a program approach. It has been decided under our NDP3 so that we, you don't move around. This is a very wide, these are very, very wide subjects. The system uh, must work together. And we have also found out that uh, our farmers, the biggest problem has been the market, which Madame Salambago mentioned on the top, elaborated on very, very well. Uh, markets, Mr. Moderator, my brother, Your Excellency Abebe, even where you have been mentioning, you have talked very well about countries, African countries, importing when they have the biggest potential to even produce and export, we are still importing. That was a, a very wise, uh, 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 but we are saying that uh, even where African countries have been given liberty to, in, to export to certain countries, European countries have allowed our African countries to export there, the Arab world, China, Japan, Russia, everybody, USA, they have opened the doors for us. But we have not had the systems that we are working, we are talking about. We have not had the systems right to make sure that we can uh, satisfy or even send our products to those markets. So, uh, Your Excellency, I just wanted to commend uh, uh, Sarah Bago. I wanted to commend my brothers uh, who are on the, the, the ministers for what they said, but I just want also to emphasize that the system is big. And, it, and I agree with the PAFO that uh, really government must really put a little bit of emphasis on funding the, uh, the, the, the agriculture. Uh, it's really very important. We are just talking about it sometimes. Uh, most of us, and I want to speak as a family, the African family, maybe Uganda, maybe Kenya, maybe the others are doing well or better or Rwanda, but still as an African family, we need to put more resources. And of course, our uh, supporters, our friends, allies, must really make sure that the systems are put right. So why this range, uh, the systems, food, the food systems is a very wide subject. And I want to say that uh, we need to uh, get our heads together, to make sure that all that wide thing is tackled so that our farmers can continue producing and they should earn from their sweat. And then we should assure everybody, including office player, office workers of food. People must have enough, and not only enough, but nutritious foods. So it's a whole range of the subject. It's a very big subject, which I want to say that FAO and the other uh, friends who organized this meeting must really look at uh, in, a, in a very special way. Thank you for uh, allowing me that moment. Thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> Honor, uh, Well, you've, you've emphasized on uh, getting our systems right. I couldn't have said it any better. Excellent. Uh, excellencies, uh, Honorable Minister, distinguished participants, we're left with uh, about uh, seven minutes before the end of this session. And we still have uh, amongst us, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, as you know, who, are, who, who is yet to speak. And I, I don't want to constrain her, but uh, I, I have seen Ambassador Tanaka raising uh, hands. And if 
in one minute, if you can please uh, make your intervention, Ambassador. Okay, uh, it's my very uh, honor uh, to be part of this uh, helpful meeting. Uh, I'm from I'm I'm uh, Ambassador Tenagashi Panyanga from uh, Zimbabwe United Nations. I just want to know that uh, is there any other uh, African nation uh, which is being uh, left out uh, in this uh, program? I think that's the only question I have. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Which program are you uh, raising? From which program are you talking about this particular session? Yes, yes, I'm talking about uh, this particular session. No, no one has been excluded. This is uh, a member states meeting and it's open to everyone. So when we are talking about uh, having not invited, it is as panelists. We have only three ministers who spoke as panelists. So we're referring to that. Otherwise, the meeting is open to all members. So there is no one uh, that has been excluded. We, there is no way that uh, member states can be excluded from this kind of meetings. Thank you for raising those, those points. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Mohammed, one minute, please. I, I see Mr. Mohammed coming and going. If you are still there, please. I don't want to go without giving the opportunity to speak from Somalia. Are you there, Mr. Mohammed? Okay, uh, I think there must be some kind of technical problem. Uh, now it's an honor and privilege for me to invite my sister, my dear sister, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, uh, who is the UN Secretary General Special Envoy to the UN, the 2021 Food System Summit. Uh, she has been doing an excellent job. Uh, I happen to be taking part in uh, some of the uh, dialogues, uh, national dialogues, as well as independent ones. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kalibata, for mobilizing, uh, you know, uh, the constituency, not just uh, from Africa, but globally, uh, towards this, uh, uh, the summits uh, that will be held uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, so uh, she was going to give us closing remarks. Uh, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bebe, and, um, uh, and honorable ministers, thank you also for having me uh, here to come and, and talk to you today. I honestly think that uh, the topic that we are discussing today, building sustainable and inclusive resilient food systems could not have come at a better time. Given all the challenges that you've already mentioned, but mostly, given the very reason that we launched the Food System Summit, the Secretary General launched the Food System Summit because we are behind on all the SDGs, nearly all the SDGs. We are walking in the, right, in the, in the, in the wrong direction. And, and uh, Maximo mentioned the number of them, so I want to go through all of them. But let me speak to the one that is, is most dear to all of us, the whole idea of hunger, right? And the fact that hunger has been increasing for the last six months in a row. Uh, so that is really something that is extremely important, but also the whole idea of climate change and the fact that it is becoming extremely difficult for farming communities to be able to be productive as they should. And yet for, for, for some time now, Africa had started seeing recovery. We're beginning to become hopeful that things are moving in the right direction. <clears throat> Economies were recovering, we were doing better on nutrition, but with the climate change, there's a lot that is at stake. And then with COVID, we have so much in terms of throwing people off balance, uh, increasing inequities and all those things. And many of you have talked about imports and I just wanted you to understand, let me just give you a number so you understand what is at stake here. In 2008, when we had the, the global food crisis, Africa was importing $15 billion worth of food. A few years later now, today, we are importing $35 billion worth of food. In 2030, it is projected that we will import, is it $100, million, $100 billion worth of food? I mean, and, and we keep talking about the opportunities and ministers. And for me, this is the biggest opportunity. And many of the ministers here, honorable ministers here talked about it. 
the biggest opportunity that our free, uh, the, the, the African continental free trade area that has just been launched is probably the biggest opportunity. Because each of you that talked went back to one key challenge, the challenge of markets and how we can open up markets. And I've worked in this space long enough to know that any farm that has a market will buy seeds, will buy fertilizers, will produce, will send their kids to school and will do all those things. So the, the elephant in the room for us is really the African free continental trade area and how we make it productive. And it's a huge opportunity. And I'm grateful that a number of ministers that came forward are talking about big ideas. The minister in, from Uganda is talking about multi-sectoral approach to, to problems, including a big opportunity that I see around the agro-industrialization and how that becomes a huge driver of what happens for inclusivity and for resilience. And the minister from Malawi is really talking about nearly the same thing and talking about strengthening resilience in new ways, looking at water, but also looking at, at markets uh, we, that, that I mentioned earlier. And the, the honorable minister from Ethiopia is coming up with even bigger inclusive programs from the perspective of looking at local challenges. In this case, the local challenge in Ethiopia being the amount of land that farmers have access to. And then this program that is designed just to address that, to ensure that there's no farmer left behind, right? The, the cluster program, which is a program I've seen in Rwanda also being used from a consolidation perspective. So, you know, the, the challenges are known, the opportunities, we, we also have a, a very good sense of many of the opportunities. And I have no question in my mind that we are on the right path, but we must overcome the challenges that are imposed from, by, our, by our food systems. And, and those challenges are, first of all, that we are not delivering the nutrition we need. Secondly, that we are still living with hunger. Third, that climate change is a major issue and our food system is part of the problem, it's contributing. Fourth, that we have to deal with inequity and the inequities that exist in our environment. And fifth, that we must build resilience from climate change and from all those other challenges. So those are the objectives, as I've said them, that constitute what the summit is, is going to be focused on. Now, in, in conclusion, I really need you to know that the summit has prepared mechanisms for every country to engage. So we have food systems dialogues taking place at country level. And I really want to encourage honorable ministers, you to engage and your teams to engage because this is how it does three things for us as countries. This is how we get to identify the challenges that are holding us back and be able to share them and even build multi-stakeholder solutions like you said, honorable minister from Uganda. We must be able to identify the opportunities as well. This is how we bring in more private sector. And this was talked about as well by the minister of Ethiopia about public private partnerships and the opportunities we can put forward. But this is also how we identify solutions. And many of you have solutions that you're already implementing, but solutions that you can also share with the rest of the world. And we have action tracks that are receiving solutions from everybody and use these solutions to create a menu that countries can look at and, and, and really find solutions to their problems. You may see solutions from, to, your, to your own problems from these action tracks, but you may so, also contribute to, to these solutions through the dialogues you're having. So I just wanted to end on a note where I'm really requesting and, and really asking you all, to pay uh, a little bit of attention to the food system summit and ensure that it's the conversations are happening in your country, in your countries, the dialogues are going on right now. Please let's ensure that we move and make sure that our voices are heard. Otherwise the summit will come and happen and our voices were not there and solutions will be shaped and we didn't contribute to those solutions. Yet as you've heard, we have great ideas that can be part of solving the problems the world is having. So I look forward to working with you all and, and really look forward to supporting you also in ensuring that these dialogues happen, but also ensuring that after the dialogues, we are also looking at solutions that we can all bring to our countries to deal with some of these problems that we are dealing with. So thank you again for inviting me. And thank you, honorable ministers, for the solutions you're putting forward, for the engagement, and for the work that you do every day. It's thankless in many times because you spend sleepless nights, but we are grateful that you do what you're doing 
and we really uh, look forward to supporting you. FAO is supporting you and other UN institutions are supporting you. And while this food system summit lasts, I will give you whatever support you need to ensure that you have these dialogues. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Agnes Kalibata for that uh, very passionate uh, address. Uh, well, you, you, you know, many of you, most of you should, should have known that uh, Dr. Kalibata uh, used to be a, a minister of uh, agriculture in her country, Rwanda. And in fact, uh, I happened to uh, uh, be a witness <laughs> of her, the leadership role that she has played among others in promoting uh, prioritization of agriculture and food agenda in Africa. Uh, you know, powerful forces behind what is now known as the Malabo commitments. Uh, so it's a pleasure, Dr. Kalibata, to have worked with you, to co have collaborated with you, continue to do the great work. Uh, I, I can assure you that uh, FAO and uh, also uh, other partners, IFAD and others, will continue to support the efforts. We are in it together. Uh, I know we don't have time. I wish we had longer time to m have this conversation, but uh, like all good things, this one is also coming towards an end. I want to thank all the honorable ministers, uh, uh, Sarah, uh, Elizabeth, uh, all the panelists for an excellent uh, discussion today. The recommendations, the good ideas that you have contributed will be uh, compiled and uh, will be part of the report uh, that will go towards the uh, the global uh, meeting, uh, LDCs uh, meeting next year. So thank you so much, uh, distinguished participants. We have had a very good, very productive session. Thank you. Over. <laughs>